My name is Ivan Smadyov. I'm coming from the Department of Physics, Renewable and Sustainable Energy Institute, and also Liquid Crystal Materials Research Center that we have at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Um, this is uh, a picture showing you our city and university campus. So, as you already know, the next icon is in Boulder. You are welcome to visit us. Of course, if you are from Boulder, then you already enjoy this beautiful place. Um, and um, so my uh, uh, lecture um, <clears throat> will discuss uh, the nonlinear optical microscopy uh, and also its use for imaging of long range orientational order uh, in different material systems. Um, so the plan for the two 45 minute long lectures is outlined here on this slide. Um, I'll start from uh, introducing the fundamentals of optical microscopy in general because during this week we'll have a number of talks on imaging uh, uh, approaches of different kind and I think it's useful, generally very useful to give this kind of introduction. Then I'll introduce different nonlinear optical processes and how they are being utilized in different nonlinear optical imaging techniques. The second part of my lecture, which will be delivered later, another 45 minutes, uh, will then focus on more specific application of such imaging approaches, which will be focused on long range um, orientational order uh, of material systems such as liquid crystals um, and also integration of those imaging techniques with uh, uh, optical manipulation. Right? <coughs> and so uh, let me start from very brief introduction to basics of microscopy. Right? So I guess in undergraduate courses or even high school courses we learn that uh, the simplest optical microscope can just consist of two lenses, right? Which we call the objective and eyepiece. Um, and uh, this instrument is intended to <coughs> build an image of an object of interest, uh, which uh, um, can be uh, viewed with other eyes or with a number of different advanced cameras, uh, such as CCDs and so on, right? But uh, this uh, very simple, uh, the simplest of all microscopes uh, uh, allows us to introduce some basic important concepts that, that are important from the standpoint of view of imaging when we use any different type of imaging technique, like whether it's confocal microscopy, nonlinear optical microscopy, or some other type of imaging. Uh, so one of those important parameters um, is uh, the so-called numerical aperture, right? The uh, um, definition of the numerical aperture is uh, depicted in here. So it, this is a parameter which basically tells us about the cone of light that we can uh, direct to the sample of image uh, of interest by using this imaging system. And so this is one of the main characteristics of objective lenses, part of pretty much any, uh, every um, optical microscope that we'll discuss later on. Um, and so uh, uh, the numerical aperture is a product of the refractive index of the medium between the objective lens uh, and the sample and the sine theta, where theta is the half angle of the cone of the light that we are focusing into the sample, right? Uh, as defined in here. Um, now, uh, of course, you know about focal plane and the working distance, which tells us how far apart from the objective we can uh, image uh, the sample by having it in focus. Uh, now, uh, uh, the value of numerical aperture will be very important uh, um, and we will see that it largely defines the resolution of the optical microscopes 
Um, and so how can we uh, vary this value? Uh, so you will see that the higher is the value uh, of the numerical aperture, the better resolution we can have. Of course, uh, uh, we can make it larger by having the, e the medium between the sample and the objective lens uh, of higher refractive index, right? But we know that there are some limits in this respect. So uh, this medium can be, in the simplest case, air. Well, then uh, n would be just very close to unity. Or, or it can be something like immersion oil. Uh, and there are different immersion oils. So um, <clears throat> most typical ones have refractive index close to uh, that of the glass, which would make it 1.5 or so. Um, and so uh, you can see that from the definition for air objective, uh, uh, when uh, the medium between the lens and the sample is air, the largest value of numerical aperture that we can have is close to 1, uh, can be approaching 1, while for immersion oil objectives, that will depend on the index of the immersion oil, but uh, in most cases it's less than 1.5, right? If uh, the refractive index of the medium is 1.5, uh, the numerical aperture value cannot be larger than that. Uh, and so um, um, that means uh, the, uh, um, as we will see a little bit later, the, uh, um, there will be some limits on resolution of optical imaging systems uh, utilizing objectives of given numerical aperture. But the higher numerical aperture, the better resolution we can achieve imaging at the given wavelengths. The other important characteristic of imaging systems so, is uh, the so-called point spread function. Um, <coughs> the point spread function simply tells us what would be the light intensity distribution uh, if we were to image uh, a, a point source of light uh, using this particular imaging system. Right? And so for the <coughs> conventional simplest microscopy systems, uh, the point spread function is the function which has a look depicted in here um, um, <coughs> where the intensity is plotted in the plane for the plane uh, orthogonal to the optical axis of the microscope um, and uh, uh, it's, um, um, it has this uh, uh, area pattern um, uh, mathematically it can be defined uh, using this expression um, that we can see here, <coughs> where uh, uh, J1 is, is a Bessel function and R is um, um, a distance from um, the center of the focus. Uh, now, as I mentioned already, the uh, point spread function and numerical aperture both determine the resolution of the imaging system and in terms of defining the resolution we often use the so-called Rayleigh uh, criterion um, so which tells us that um, uh, the um, best we can do in terms of resolving two point sources of light uh, uh, is when the point spread function uh, start to overlap in such a way that the width of the point spread function, uh, uh, the, the distance between the centers of the two point spread functions becomes comparable to the width of the point spread function. Uh, if, the, uh, if this distance is smaller than this width, then the two objects cannot be resolved. Uh, and uh, uh, this sets a resolution limit um, and so because we have seen that um, this parameter in here in the point spread function depends on the numerical aperture, this in, the, determines the intrinsic uh, resolution of the imaging system. Now, in terms of the modes of imaging or imaging modalities, uh, the simplest one is the so-called bright field 
microscopy, uh, in which case the contrast um, that we see in the image is derived from simple re linear processes such as refraction, scattering, or absorption of light, right? So in other words, as we are viewing the sample that's placed in between the condenser and objective lenses, uh, the uh, processes like refraction, scattering of light, and absorption of light uh, give rise to an image um, that we can see. And so here you can see uh, such examples. So th this is an array of um, uh, cells of bacteria, bacteria Pseudomonas aeruginosa, uh, viewed just um, uh, in a plain optical microscope in the bright field microscopy uh, imaging mode. Uh, and then here you can see some uh, pattern of uh, defects in asthmatic liquid crystal. Again, uh, the um, uh, contrast in this image is derived from uh, mostly from scattering and refraction of light. Um, <clears throat> so in the imaging systems of the, the simplest optical microscope, the objective um, <coughs> Uh, the objective lens uh, and the condenser lens um, can have different or same numerical aperture and uh, um, the optimum imaging conditions can be achieved in the, uh, uh, by, by using so-called color uh, illumination approach. <coughs> the other imaging approach is um, the so-called dark field microscopy, right? So, uh, um, um, <clears throat> let me explain you how it differs from the bright field microscopy that we just discussed previously. So we again have uh, a condenser lens and, and the objective lens uh, and then eyepiece of, um, <clears throat> to, to uh, form the image if you are just viewing it. Um, but the difference compared to the bright field microscopy is that um, the uh, center of this microscope is um, <clears throat> preventing the direct light from forming the image, right? So uh, uh, we have a, a light stop um, in such a way placed uh, uh, in the dark field condenser in such a way that um, on the light coming to the sample at fairly large incidence angles um, uh, can reach the sample, right? Just like depicted in here. Um, and so uh, then we can use an objective lens of a smaller numerical aperture or we can use another stop of light uh, in such a way that the direct light is overall excluded from reaching uh, the uh, image plane uh, or reaching the detector. Um, <clears throat> and only light which is scattered in the sample can, uh, can be used to form the image, right? So, for example, if we have in the sample some tiny objects like nanoparticles uh, of different kind that scatter light uh, they can then be viewed using this dark field microscope. And so if there are no scattering objects, we just have plain black background. If there are, however, some scattering objects in here, such as gold nanoparticles that we can view uh, in this image on the right, uh, they scatter light, uh, and so this light is then um, propagating to the eyepiece and it forms an image um, <clears throat> uh, or it can be used using different types of cameras. Uh, so the example that you can see on this slide uh, is um, uh, in, those are images of uh, gold nanorods um, that have been viewed using dark gold microscopy. So the background around uh, is just a solvent of some kind uh, that's not scattering light uh, significantly. And then the gold nanoparticles, uh, because uh, of being 
uh, plasmonic nanoparticles scattered light uh, with the scattering uh, being the strongest uh, at uh, uh, the uh, surface plasma resonance frequencies uh, they, they give this unique appearance of um, uh, goldish looking uh, rod like particles that we can see in this dark field image uh, the other microscopy technique, uh, which is again linear microscopy technique, uh, uh, widely used in the study of material systems, is uh, the polarizing optical microscopy. Uh, in the case of this technique, the sample is placed uh, between the crossed polarizer and analyzer. The, those polarizers can also be parallel or at some angle. Um, uh, but the idea is that we use polarized light for imaging and then probe how polarization of light changed due to presence of the sample, right? So the second polarizer, which we call analyzer, is helping us to analyze polarization of light that passed through the sample of interest. And so this technique is very widely used uh, in imaging of liquid crystals and crystals of different kinds. Uh, so we start, for example, with unpolarized light source. The polarizer makes this uh, light linearly polarized, which is then depolarized somehow uh, in the sample that we study. So the polarization can change from linear to, to elliptical, or it can be rotated somehow with respect to uh, the original orientation of the linear polarization light uh, of the light uh, set by the polarizer. And then we can probe this polarization <coughs> by using the second polarizer, which we call analyzer, right? And then this light is used to form an image. So an image between cross polarizers can look, uh, for example, as some texture that I showing here as an example. Uh, this is um, a texture of a liquid crystal uh, between two cross polarizers um, and uh, the texture tells us about orientation of the so-called liquid crystal director or optical axis uh, in the plane of the sample. Um, uh, so um, the dark stripes uh, in an image like you can see in here tell us the, about the regions where uh, the optical axis and director are either parallel or perpendicular to polarizer and analyzer, while in the regions, um, in the bright regions, the orientation of the director and optical axis of this material is at some intermediate angles um, between the orientations of polarizer and analyzer. Uh, <coughs> So, uh, uh, obviously, looking at an image like this uh, and also maybe rotating such a sample between cross polarizer and analyzer, we can already get an idea about uh, the orientation of optical axis in this sample of interest. Um, but one issue that one has to, um, uh, to deal with while using this technique to image uh, uh, the liquid crystal samples is that we cannot tell apart whether the director is aligned parallel to polarizer or to analyzer, right? Because um, um, they, they are crossed and the um, dark brushes correspond to either parallel or perpendicular orientation of optical axis, uh, parallel to polarizer or analyzer. Uh, and so, uh, uh, this can be, however, uh, th this problem can be resolved quite effectively by using uh, the uh, additional uh, um, bifringent plate, which can be inserted in here in the optical uh, setup of the microscope. So this can be an accessory plate, which is a bifringent plate with known orientation of optical axis and known by fringes. And then we can probe how the phase retardation of light 
uh, that uh, is due to the, the sample that we study and the phase retardation of light due to the biofringent plate that we use uh, as an accessory plate, uh, how do they add or subtract uh, um, uh, <coughs> and uh, uh, by probing that, we can um, uh, figure out whether in those dark brushes whether the polarization, uh, whether the optical axis is parallel to polarizer or analyzer, and we can unambiguously determine the orientation of optical axis and director of liquid crystal. So an example of um, an image obtained using such a uh, biofringent plate which is often called also red plate, uh, is shown in here. This plate is um, uh, introduced with um, uh, orientation of the uh, slow optical axis at 45 degrees with respect to cross polarizer and analyzer. Um, and so uh, in the regions where um, the um, phase retardation of uh, <coughs> Phase retardations uh, due to the sample and the plate add together, uh, we uh, see the interference color of uh, the second order um, uh, and in the regions uh, which would be blue and in the regions where they subtract we see <coughs> the first order interference color um, uh, and uh, by analyzing images like this we can um, unambiguously reconstruct the orientation of liquid crystal direction here. Now, uh, in addition to the biofringent phase retardation plates, uh, one can also use the so-called Bertrand lens um, that can uh, allow us to probe uh, the uh, orientation of optical axis in a uniform uh, biofringent sample. Uh, or it can also um, probe, uh, allow one to probe whether the material is uniaxial or biaxial in nature. Right? And so in here you can see, um, so the, the Bertrand lens would be introduced after the polarizer in uh, such a, a setup of the polarizing of a microscope right in here. Um, uh, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, interference of light then allows one to form the so-called conoscopic image, uh, examples of which you can see in here. Those are the images obtained for uh, the sample with uh, uh, the orientation of the optical axis uh, of the perfringent sample parallel to the optical axis of the microscope. Um, uh, those are uh, uniaxial samples that have been probed in here. Uh, and uh, the function of the Bertrand lens in this case is to bring into focus the image and the back aperture uh, of the objective lens. Right? And so then the interference uh, image formed by um, light passing the sample uh, at different angles. Um, um, has a form similar to the one shown in here for, for the uniform orientation of the optical axis. And as I mentioned already, it can be used to probe orientation of optical axis and also to probe whether the sample is uh, very stringent or uh, whether it's, <coughs> the sample is uniaxial or biaxial. Now, uh, uh, as well as orientations of different axes of uh, biaxial crystals. Um, now, there are a number of um, <coughs> um, other techniques which utilize polarized light uh, uh, to derive contrast. One of them is, for example, uh, differential interference contrast microscopy, uh, where in addition to um, uh, in addition to the polarizer and analyzer, which we have seen before in the previous image, um, one also has uh, additional two prisms, 
um, the so-called Nomarsky prisons, uh, which uh, allowed to separate the ordinary and extraordinary uh, ways of light uh, laterally in the plane of the sample, uh, and this allows one to enhance the contrast uh, between the uh, uh, different constituents of sample of slightly different refractive index. Uh, um, the um, other contrast, uh, um, uh, the other source of contrast in um, optical microscopy is uh, uh, the fluorescence, uh, the pro fluorescence property, um, and uh, um, the fluorescence microscopy uh, in its simplest form uh, simply utilizes the fluorescence property of the chromophores or fluorescent dyes. Uh, so when uh, excited at the shorter wavelengths of light, um, by absorption of a photon at a shorter wavelengths of light, the dye molecules typically undergo um, non-radiative process uh, and then um, um, uh, there is an emission at uh, a longer wavelength of light, right? So then if one were to study uh, the absorption and fluorescence spectra, those are typically uh, shifted with respect to each other, so the emission is at uh, wavelengths longer than the absorption of light, um, and the shift of maxima of absorption and fluorescence is often called the stop shift. Right? Uh, now, because the fluorescence and the absorption of light are spectrally separated, uh, one can um, use fluorescence filters and dichroic mirrors to separate them in um, a simple uh, fluorescence microscope. Um, and uh, to do it, uh, most, most commonly people utilize the so-called fluorescence cube, uh, which consists of emission uh, uh, and um, excitation filters and also a dichroic mirror. Um, so, um, as you can see, uh, the absorption, the maximum absorption and fluorescence are different frequencies, and because the fluorescence signal is only a tiny, tiny fraction compared to the excitation uh, signal, uh, one needs to um, separate those two signals from each other uh, spectrally, so that only the fluorescence signal and not excitation light can be used to form the image of interest. Um, and so this can be uh, done in the simplest way by using this fluorescence cube. Um, so, um, so um, um, uh, which consists of the chronic mirror and both um, fluorescence uh, excitation and uh, uh, emission filters. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, if we have a um, um, light source that we use for excitation, which can be, um, for example, a, a white light, light source, uh, uh, an intense um, bulb, for example, of, of intense uh, uh, light, um, uh, then uh, uh, by passing the uh, excitation filter, um, we uh, assure that uh, the excitation light is uh, at the wavelength uh, at, which, uh, at which the chromophore of interest is efficient absorbing light, um, then this light is reflected by the, the, the dichroic mirror to the sample, uh, the fluorescent light in the sample uh, is emitted in all possible directions um, and including the backward uh, geometry uh, so that it can go, you know, from the sample through the objective lens uh, 
in the backward geometry um, uh, back to, to the same dichroic mirror. However, now this dichroic mirror can pass uh, the fluorescent light. Right? It's designed in, in such a way that uh, uh, it reflects the light of shorter wavelengths, but uh, can pass the um, light at the longer wavelengths, which is fluorescent light. And then the um, fluorescence filter uh, in here uh, further assures that only fluorescent light at a longer frequency and not the absorption, uh, not the excitation light will reach the detector and result in the formation of the image. Um, and so in here you can see an example uh, of such an image that's formed by um, the fluorescent signal coming from the fluorescent labeled colloidal particles um, uh, in a soft matter system where those particles uh, aggregate into a network uh, of interconnected chains. Um, so uh, now um, the techniques we have discussed so far um, provide only two-dimensional optical resolution, right? So, in other words, we can resolve features uh, in the sample in the plane um, orthogonal to the optical axis of the microscope. However, those techniques have very poor ability of resolving features along the optical axis of the microscope. Uh, the technique, the first technique which enabled this um, uh, possibility was confocal microscopy. Um, and uh, the main idea of the confocal microscopy is uh, uh, um, that uh, um, that uh, uh, one can probe uh, the sample point by point uh, and then reconstruct the image by using computer software, for example. Uh, in order to uh, do such imaging of the sample, um, typically one utilizes this, the focused laser beam uh, and uh, um, uh, also uh, uh, fluorescent dyes, just like in fluorescence microscopy. But um, the most important feature is uh, the pinhole, which is typically placed in the plane conjugate uh, <coughs> with uh, the focal plane of the objective in such a way that only the light coming from the focal plane of the objective can reach uh, uh, the detector. Uh, <coughs> and uh, as I mentioned already, this technique enables both uh, resolution in the lateral plane orthogonal to the optical axis of the microscope and also in the plane um, along the optical axis of the microscope. So the uh, schematic that I have in here is intended to depict how um, uh, the confocal microscopy works in, in the simplest form, the way it was originally proposed several decades ago uh, 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 several decades ago. So uh, uh, the light uh, coming from the source of light um, is focused into a tiny volume in the sample um, and then the fluorescent light is being collected through a pinhole in such a way that all the light from this um, probed uh, tiny volume in the sample can reach uh, the detector such as a photomultiplying tube in here, right? And the light that would be coming from the regions above or below uh, the focal point simply will not be effectively focused through the pinhole in here and therefore will not uh, participate in the formation of an image. Um, so the sample is being scanned point by point and then uh, the computer software simply is used to reconstruct this three-dimensional image of the sample.
Uh, again, just like in fluorescence microscopy, in uh, fluorescence confocal microscopy, one utilizes chromophores and uh, the uh, excitation is typically done by the lasers, um, uh, using laser beams, um, and uh, by using the fluorescence filters, by using interference filters, one can separate the excitation light from the fluorescence light. Right? So uh, the graph I show it here shows us how uh, one can, for example, excite uh, the chromophore at one wavelength, like that of the argon laser here, and detect the fluorescence signal within a certain spectral range um, um, in such a way that the excitation light does not participate in the formation of fluorescence image because we detect the fluorescence light only within the spectral range uh, selected by the interference filters um, depicted on this graph. Right? Uh, um, and um, um, so one can use uh, a number of different laser uh, excitations and corresponding different uh, fluorescent dyes for such an image. Okay. So um, uh, the schematic that I show in here is probably most commonly utilized uh, uh, nowadays. Um, this is um, the fluorescence confocal microscope working in the so-called epifluorescence or epidetection mode where uh, the very same objective lens uh, it's used for focusing the excitation light and also for detecting the fluorescence light coming from the sample. Um, so, as I mentioned already, uh, using the previous schematic, uh, the uh, excitation light uh, is being focused to the sample and then the fluorescence light obviously goes in all directions but also in the backward direction too, uh, and it's being collected by the very same objective lens. Um, then the beam splitter in here um, <coughs> is designed in such a way that it passed the excitation beam before to the sample, but it's reflecting the fluorescence light um, uh, as shown in here. And then uh, the pinhole is placed in a plane uh, which is confocal with the focal plane uh, in the sample that we study um, in such a way that the fluorescence light coming from the focal plane uh, in the sample is effectively focused through the pinhole and uh, is being detected by the detector like photomultiplying tube. Now the light coming from above and below the focal plane um, is not focused through this uh, pinhole, and therefore only tiny, tiny fraction of it can reach the detector, right? So it doesn't participate much in the formation of image, and this allows us to achieve the resolution not only in the lateral plane um, perpendicular to the optical axis of the microscope, but also one can better resolve uh, the features along the optical axis of the microscope, right? So therefore, by using this technique, one can already build um, uh, a three-dimensional image. The resolution uh, in the optical microscope, which uh, tells us how well we can resolve um, uh, different features in the lateral plane and in the axial plane of the sample, um, uh, is shown in here for the confocal microscopy. So it's comparable to the resolution of the regular optical microscope in the lateral plane, although it's a little bit better um, uh, <coughs> due to the reason that in here we use laser excitation um, and uh, it can be as good as 250 nanometers uh, if we use, for example, blue excitation light um, um, and uh, the Excel resolution is somewhat worse um, but um, 
Again, it can be sub-micron, uh, for example, for 488 nanometer excitation, one can achieve um, with all um, uh, parameters of the microscope optimized, one can achieve about half a micrometer resolution in the axial direction. Uh, and so what's important here, and what you notice from those uh, expressions that I can give, that I given here, is that resolution is inversely proportional, in the case of uh, lateral resolution, it's inversely proportional to the numerical aperture of the objective. Uh, and it's proportional to numerical aperture, uh, one over numerical aperture squared, uh, in the case of axial resolution, right? So you can see that uh, the having the highest possible numerical aperture is absolutely critical uh, from the standpoint of view of optimizing resolution and achieving best possible resolution in the confocal microscopy, just like also in other imaging approaches that we have discussed and will discuss later on during the talk. Um, so, um, the confocal microscopy allows you to build, uh, to, to scan the sample point by point and build a three-dimensional image that you would otherwise not be able to uh, uh, obtain using a plain regular, confocal, uh, regular uh, optical microscope. Right? So here I give some examples of colloidal crystals where on the left uh, you can see um, just re uh, an image uh, obtained by collecting the fluorescent signal in a confocal microscopy um, and then the reconstructed um, three-dimensional structure of colloidal particles in such a colloidal crystal is depicted in here, right? Uh, so the particles that have been imaged in here in this colloidal crystal again have been uh, labeled by using fluorescence dye uh, and then this allowed to obtain such a three-dimensional image. Uh, now, one important property of fluorescence imaging and also confocal fluorescence imaging is that one can utilize multiple dyes to label different components of the material system. Um, and so, of course, in this case, uh, one has to use fluorescent dyes that have well-separated absorption and fluorescence spectra. Um, and so, in here I give an example of uh, two different dyes that can, uh, that, that have the fluorescence and absorption spectra depicted on this graph. You can see that they are se uh, well separated spectrally and the absorption and fluorescence spectra of one dye barely overlap with those of the other dye so that one can use two different laser uh, wavelengths, uh, two different lasers to excite the two dyes separately and then uh, uh, image uh, the sample, uh, you know, composite ma uh, materials uh, where different components are labeled by different fluorescence dyes. Uh, uh, and so in order to be able to do it, the fluorescence confocal microscope has to be a little bit further complicated by uh, uh, using another beam splitter that will then uh, separate the uh, fluorescence signals coming from different fluorescence dyes um, and then uh, additional set of fluorescence filters which will further separate and assure uh, uh, fluores separate fluorescence signals and assure that uh, uh, only the fluorescent signal from a dye of interest is capable of reaching the photo detector um, in the channel intended to uh, detect the signal from this particular dye. Um, and so in here you can see an, exam an example uh, of an image uh, obtained in a mixture of DNA and filamentous actin, where those two different biological polymers have been labeled by using different fluorescence dyes, so that one of them is being detected 
uh, the fluorescence from one of them is being detected by one positron multiplying tube and one channel of imaging, and the fluorescence signal from the other one is being detected in the other channel um, uh, using this imaging uh, approach. Now, one can do more than just uh, uh, two, uh, labeling this more than just two dyes. Uh, and so in here you can see more complicated biological examples where three different fluorescence dyes have been used and therefore three different uh, um, lasers have been utilized to um, excite those three different fluorescent dyes uh, uh, and then the overlay of fluorescent signals coming from those different fluorescent dyes uh, in a single image allows one to simple, uh, simply visualize um, how the different components of this complex biological system are spatially located with respect to each other. Um, the um, setup for fluorescence for focal microscopy um, can have a look uh, in a lab similar to what you can see here where uh, the, uh, the, the excitation laser beams are simply brought by uh, the uh, optical fiber and scanned by uh, a confocal unit uh, so that the sample in, in, uh, on the stage somewhere here can be uh, easily imaged using um, uh, lasers at different um, uh, wavelengths of light depending on the need. <clears throat> now, one disadvantage of uh, the confocal microscopy is that we probe the sample point by point and it takes some time to scan the laser beam um, um, uh, within the sample of interest, especially if this two-dimensional volume of interest is fairly large. It can take minutes of time or even more. Um, and so that means we will not be able to probe dynamic processes using this technique. Uh, so one approach um, which allows to do uh, fast imaging, um, called focal microscopy in, in, uh, uh, <coughs> at much faster rate is um, um, to utilize the so-called nickel disk. Uh, the setup for such imaging uh, approach is shown in here. Uh, it basically consists of two couplet discs, the Nipco disc and a disc of uh, micro lenses, which can spin, being couplet mechanically, they spin together uh, in such a way that uh, the sample is illuminated by thousands of beams at the same time. Um, and because light travels uh, very fast, so although this, this disk is being rotated all the time, uh, since light travels much faster than the rotation of um, uh, the Nipco the disk, um, the uh, fluorescence light coming from the sample is passing through pretty much the same set of pinholes uh, in the Nipco disk and, and uh, um, then um, uh, is being detected effectively in the same way as in a uh, confocal microscopy mold that we discussed before, right? So we have illumination um, uh, through the set of pinholes and detection by use of the very same set of pinholes in a rotating spinning disk uh, that allows to uh, sample, uh, to, to scan the sample at much faster rates. Uh, and so uh, uh, the confocal imaging done using this approach um, can be 1,000 to 10,000 times faster. Uh, and therefore, um, uh, if, especially if using fast cameras um, in this approach, one can achieve um, confocal scanning at the rate of about 1,000 frames per second, um, and therefore uh, this approach can be utilized to um, um, 
study dynamic processes too. So it essentially gives us also temporal resolution. Um, so all of the techniques we have discussed so far, they were uh, linear optical microscopy techniques, right? So the, the processes uh, that um, um, those techniques are based on are uh, linear in nature. Um, and so um, uh, <coughs> if one were to consider the polarization induced in the material or in the sample probe for using those techniques, uh, we essentially dealt with the first term uh, in this expression where the polarization is linearly proportional to the electric field uh, of uh, the probing light. Um, however, uh, the recent developments in um, nonlinear optical microscopy utilize, uh, you, you know, recent technique, recently developed techniques, um, nonlinear optical microscopy techniques utilize um, uh, the processes that would be described by second and third um, terms in this expression, um, and those include uh, two photon and three photon excitation fluorescence microscopy, second and third harmonic generation microscopy, coherent anti stop trauma scattering microscopy, and also stimulated trauma scattering microscopy. Right? So, um, um, I will now proceed with discussing the basic principles behind uh, those nonlinear optical processes, uh, and um, um, I'll show how uh, they can give many benefits in terms of three-dimensional optical imaging of uh, different uh, samples of interest. Right? So, um, in uh, the remaining part of this is my lecture. Um, I will give an overview um, uh, of what are those <coughs> nonlinear optical processes. But I would like to start from um, a basic motivation um, why they are of interest uh, and, and what are the benefits that they can provide. So we have seen that in order to uh, have three dimensional optical resolution with the resolution along the axis of the optical microscope, we had to utilize um, something like a pinhole in a confocal microscopy system, right? In order to reject the light coming from away, uh, farther away from the focal uh, plane of such um, a confocal microscope. Um, <clears throat> we will see that the advantage of all nonlinear optical processes that we will discuss the main advantage is that the intensity of light very quickly drops uh, as a function of distance uh, along the optical axis of the microscope, right? So, uh, uh, and uh, the probability of excitation in, in for example, two-photon excitation process falls as uh, the distance from the focal plane to the power four um, and therefore, uh, the simplest nonlinear optical process such as two photon excitation fluorescence and also more uh, advanced processes than other ones that we will discuss will all provide uh, intrinsic three dimensional optical resolution, right? So, in which case, we will not need to utilize uh, something like a pinhole in the confocal microscopy setup in order to be able to resolve the features along the optical axis of the microscope. <coughs> so the, um, uh, the uh, diagram, the Oblonsky diagram for uh, the two photon absorption process is uh, shown in here. Uh, in this process, um, the um, energy of two or more photons um, combine to excite uh, chromophore, um, and so uh, uh, in, in the example I show in here is a two photon absorption process. So just like in regular, uh, uh, in the case of regular fluorescence, um, <coughs> the, um, um, we have uh, the absorption, 
That's the first part of, of this process. However, in this case, now there are two quotas needed in order to uh, um, uh, have, uh, to excite the chromophore. Uh, then we have non-radiative process um, and eventually uh, fluorescent emission. Uh, <coughs> however, because the probability of um, absorption of um, uh, two photons at the same time is so low that uh, it can happen only when you have high enough intensity of the excitation light. Uh, therefore, if you focus the laser beam, the excitation uh, uh, laser beam into the sample, uh, the uh, uh, absorption, two photon absorption can effecti effectively happen only within uh, the uh, close vicinity of the focal point of this objective lens, right? And so, uh, uh, therefore, the fluorescent light is emitted also only from this um, with close vicinity of the focal point, and this provides the intrinsic resolution uh, uh, that we will see uh, is enabled by two photon absorption, uh, fluorescence, and also other nonlinear optical processes. Um, so as I already mentioned, the probability of simultaneous absorption of two or more photons is very low. Um, and um, uh, uh, the intensity of fluorescence light um, falls off uh, very fast above and below the focus, therefore, um, we have intrinsic resolution in, the, in this process so that we do not need to use a pinhole or confocal microscopy center. Instead, all light coming from the sample can be collected uh, and uh, we only need to scan the sample without worrying about uh, using the uh, pinhole in, in the detection system. Um, <clears throat> so the cartoon in here uh, again gives us a comparison of um, uh, how the fluorescence emission is different in a regular confocal microscopy system and also in a, a, a two-photon excitation fluorescence microscopy system. So in, in the case of um, two-photon absorption excitation um, process, we can see that the fluorescence uh, is um, uh, effectively excited only in the vicinity of the uh, focal point of the sample, while in the case of linear single photon absorption, uh, there is a fairly strong excitation um, pretty far above and below the focal plane of the sample. Right. And so um, the um, procedure is now, um, so, so in the case of single photon process that would be utilized in a regular confocal microscopy setup, one would have to use a pinhole, but also the excitation has to be done um, at a wavelength shorter uh, than the uh, wavelength of emission that will be then detected um, by the detector. Um, this is different in the case of two photon uh, excitation process because uh, the excitation is done at a wavelength longer than the, um, the wavelength of the fluorescent light that will be emitted from the sample. And the biggest benefit is, again, that we don't have to use a pinhole in order to um, make this uh, um, um, in, in order to do this image. Now, of course, in addition to the big benefits, typical one has some drawbacks, and one of them is that we do need fairly large um, <coughs> intensities of the excitation laser beams in order to uh, do this type of imaging. Um, <coughs> And so, uh, 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 because we have seen that the 
probability of the two photon absorption is um, fairly low unless you have fairly high intensity of the excitation light. Um, and so uh, uh, this is typically achieved by using pulsed laser beams, which are quite a lot uh, more expensive than, than the uh, continuous wave laser beams uh, that could be utilized for the regular confocal microscopy. Um, and so uh, um, uh, now, however, although the instantaneous laser power is fairly large, uh, the uh, average laser power can be still fairly low, uh, can be well below a milliwatt of laser power, so uh, one doesn't have to worry about damaging uh, the sample uh, in the course of imaging. Um, and um, uh, so if one utilizes uh, the uh, pulse laser beams, for example, um, 100 femtoseconds uh, uh, pulses every 10 nanoseconds, uh, then this can um, give a fairly large instantaneous power uh, of the order of 5 to uh, multiplied by 10 to power 10 watt per centimeter squared, uh, although again the instantaneous laser power, uh, sorry, the average laser power is fairly low, so there is no need to worry about um, damaging the sample, right? And the cartoon that you can see here shows that uh, the, uh, although the instantaneous laser power is very large, the average laser power uh, in this kind of setting can be tuned to be low enough uh, to avoid the damage of the sample. So the uh, uh, two photon um, fluorescence and also other nonlinear optical microscopy techniques can be utilized by using a fairly simple setup, uh, which is depicted in here. So again, unlike in focal microscopy, we do not need detection using pinholes in this case. Um, but one can utilize a tunable uh, pulse laser, such as Tysify laser, um, and uh, uh, you know the polarization uh, of this light can be controlled by a combination of a polarizer and uh, a half wave plate, for example. Um, and the the laser beam still has to be scanned throughout the sample point by point. So for this. Uh, typically, one needs to utilize a set of Galo mirrors um, and also a piezo drive in order to scan the sample uh, along the axial direction. Uh, and uh, one can either scan uh, the sample or scan an objective. Um, then the detection can be done either in anti detection mode just like also in the example of confocal microscopy system we have seen before, or it can be also done in the forward detection mode, in which case we would need another objective in here in order to collect the fluorescent light in the forward detection mode. Uh, so uh, the very same system, however, that, that I show in here can be also used uh, to do imaging in other uh, nonlinear optical microscopy mode. Um, and the second one that I want to discuss um, um, will be uh, the, um, uh, the se second and third harmonic generation microscopy. So I'll discuss it in a couple minutes from now. <coughs> so um, to summarize what we have discussed, we've seen that uh, in order to excite chromophores, we can of course use a single photon excitation process, um, which has some advantages but also disadvantages. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the biggest advantage is that because it's a linear optical process, we uh, can work with regular uh, continuous wave, wave, uh, wave 
lasers and um, um, you know, we can utilize confocal microscopy setup to do three-dimensional optical imaging. <laughs> However, the multi-photon excitation um, provides the advantage of uh, having the ability of exciting the chromophores by infrared laser beams at a wavelength much larger, much longer than uh, the wavelength of emitted fluorescence light. Uh, and um, uh, and therefore, uh, uh, we also do not have to worry about <coughs> the use of pinholes um, in order uh, to achieve this three-dimensional resolution, including the resolution along the optical axis of the microscope. Uh, <coughs> um, and so, uh, because of the intrinsic nonlinear optical nature of the multi-photon excitation process, as we have seen, we can excite the chromophores only in the vicinity of the focal plane uh, of the uh, objective um, and uh, detect the fluorescence light uh, <coughs> uh, coming from the region of interest in this case uh, <coughs> uh, in the close vicinity of the focal point of the sample. <coughs> now, What's important is that many uh, materials um, um, do have uh, the properties of cell fluorescence uh, if they are excited um, in the uh, UV part of the uh, optical spectrum. And so, of course, it's uh, typically very difficult to do um, uh, because, uh, as you know, the optics for uh, ultraviolet part of the optical spectrum is very complicated since most of the uh, objectives, uh, uh, most of the regular lenses would highly absorb in this uh, part of the optical spectrum. So it's not very easy to do uh, for most of the materials. However, uh, if one utilizes two photon or three photon uh, ex um, excitation process, um, uh, then uh, uh, it's possible to obtain cell fluorescence signals from materials without even using dyes. And so in here is one of such examples where the fluorescence is coming from um, the uh, material itself when no uh, fluorescent dyes is used to label it, and this is uh, um, a liquid crystal sample with a colloidal particle uh, incorporated into it. So we'll discuss examples of this kind a little bit later too. Uh, um, so uh, the other advantage uh, of using uh, the multi-photon excitation processes is that uh, uh, as I already mentioned, one can do excitation in the near infrared part of the optical spectrum, uh, and this is especially beneficial for um, biological tissue because for the imaging of biological tissue, because in the near infrared, somewhere between 700 and 1100 nanometers, there is the so-called uh, uh, biological transparency window where uh, biological tissue does not absorb much and also does not scatter light that much. And so by um, uh, using this property, one can therefore achieve very deep penetration uh, of the imaging light into the biological tissue. Uh, um, and so the... Um, um, the summary slide that I, I'm showing it here uh, is um, uh, summarizing uh, the advantages and disadvantages of uh, uh, the multi-photon excitation uh, approaches that uh, we have discussed so far. Uh, so, so far we just discussed uh, multi-photon absorption fluorescence imaging, but we'll in a couple minutes, or maybe during the second part of the lecture, we'll proceed with other nonlinear optical um, uh, imaging approaches. So, so far, the, we can see that the advantage 
uh, of using nonlinear uh, multi photon absorption processes for imaging uh, is um, um, that um, we have um, uh, low out of focus photo bleaching, low photo damage, um, because we can excite only the region of interest without exciting uh, the chromophores far away from, uh, from um, the focal point of the sample. Uh, uh, also low photo damage because uh, the fact that the tissue or other materials do not absorb in the uh, near infrared part of the spectrum also means we do not heat them that much. Uh, and so there is, uh, um, uh, we don't need to worry about damaging the sample that much too. Uh, <clears throat> so one can also excite uh, the uh, chromophores that can be, um, that absorb in the ultraviolet part of the optical spectrum by using either visible or infrared part, uh, 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 infrared excitation laser beams. Uh, and so, uh, in addition, we can probe uh, the samples using, um, uh, <coughs> even without the use of the dye, by use, uh, uh, without the use of the dyes, by using their cell fluorescence properties. Um, and uh, uh, the technique also provides inherent optical sectioning uh, with the resolution also along the optical axis of the microscope. Uh, uh, as well as the ability to work with sick specimens um, that would be impossible um, uh, by using, for example, confocal microscopy, even though confocal microscopy does provide uh, the resolution along the optical axis of microscope too. The biggest disadvantages, however, are the expensive lasers um, and uh, um, the other disadvantage is that multicolor imaging uh, that we have seen could be easily implemented by using fluorescence microscopy or fluorescence confocal microscopy is more difficult to achieve in the case of um, multi-photon uh, excitation fluorescence uh, uh, microscopy. Uh, so my uh, plan further is to discuss uh, second and third harmonic generation microscopy and also uh, CARS and uh, simulated Raman scattering microscopy. However, I can see that it's time for lunch. So um, we are actually running a little bit behind uh, of the schedule. So I propose we stop here and um, um, you know, uh, I'll continue later on when, when we have time for that. Thank you for your attention.